Our nine-mile journey to Whitechapel begins at the street-level Hammersmith Met Station, which dates back to 1868, four years after the opening of the line in 1864. As our C-stop train departs from Platform 2, we can immediately see to our right the Hammersmith and City Line's main depot, built in 1906 at the time of electrification. Just to our left can be seen the remains of the access to the former goods siding. The track is due to be reinstated for use as additional train stabling, and provision has been made for it to run beneath the recently constructed Wimpy office building. Just beyond can be seen evidence of the former connection with the district railway at Studland Road Junction, removed in 1916. All surface stock trains, as opposed to tube stock, are now driver-only operated. Goldhawk Road Station, Shepherd's Bush, was opened in 1914, exactly 50 years after the rest of the line. The line runs on viaduct alongside Shepherd's Bush Market and past the site of the original station. Shepherd's Bush Station was recited here concurrent with the opening of Goldhawk Road in 1914. Close to the BBC television centre was the site of a temporary wooden station called Wood Lane, opened in 1908 at the same time as the Central Line. Wood Lane Central closed in 1947 but authority was not forthcoming for the Met Station's closure. One night, when everybody had gone home, the station, by now called White City, mysteriously caught fire and burnt to the ground. It was never reopened. Notice the wide viaducts. 
The original line, built by the Hammersmith and City Company, was of mixed gauge. As well as the standard gauge, the GWR, partners in the venture, insisted on their broad gauge being laid. Although the first trains were broad gauge, belonging to the GWR, the Metropolitans soon took over and the extra rail was removed after only four years. We're now crossing the West London line. Just to the right can be seen remains of the one-time connection. The line is used by cross London into city trains via Clapham Junction, Kensington Olympia and Wilsdon. Latimer Road was opened in 1868, just before the removal of the broad gauge rails. Still on the original brick viaduct, the line now swings further east and draws alongside the elevated A40M Westway. This was the area where Rillington Place used to be, home of the mass murderer John Reginald Christie. Ladbroke Grove was originally opened under the name of Notting Hill. When the line was first built, much of the route was through open tracts of land. It wasn't until the end of the 19th century that the area became fully built up. On the left can be seen a fog repeater. These are found on open sections of line, 100 yards in front of a stop signal. In poor visibility, it not only indicates the aspect, but serves to warn the driver of the signal's exact location. There's a 20 mile an hour speed limit as we approach Westbourne Park, adjacent to the Western Region Main Line from Paddington. The station was opened in 1871 and is also served by BR's Greenford service. Incidentally, the twin aspect colour light signal prefix A denotes that it is fully automatic. So far, only at Hammersmith has there been semi-automatic control. The next signal cabin is Edgware Road. As the number of running lines into Paddington increased during the 1870s, it became necessary to abandon the flat junction in favour of this fly-under, which was brought into use in 1878. Nowadays, there's no connection with the BR lines here at all.
Royal Oak Station was opened in 1871, at the same time as Westbourne Park. And so we approach Paddington, only a small village outside London when the GWR first established itself here. The Metropolitan tracks were first housed in a separate station called Bishop's Road. Various enlargements and alterations occurred with the passage of time, and the current layout, where Metropolitan trains use platforms 15 and 16, dates from 1967, Bishop's Road having been incorporated into the main station back in 1933. From here to Farringdon, the line dates right back to the 10th of January, 1863, the first passenger carrying underground railway in the world. The old tunnels are even darker than imaginable, and these unique views are only possible with an image intensifying camera. Our driver commented that he can see the tunnels clearer through the TV screen than he can with the naked eye. Here, the Circle Line and Edgware Road branch of the district converge at Praed Street Junction under the control of Edgware Road signal box. The signals now incorporate two sets of twin aspects. The upper applies now, and the lower are distance or repeaters for the next. Edgware Road is a terminus for the district line branch from Wimbledon. It's also the headquarters of the sector that's responsible for both the Hammersmith and City and Circle lines combined. The group is simply called Circle and Hammersmith.
train frequency along here is two and a half minutes off peak in each direction, alternating between metropolitan and circle line trains. gradient of 1 in 95 takes us down into Baker Street. The platform lines then rise at 1 in 90. Platforms 5 and 6 have been thoroughly restored to try to recreate the original Victorian atmosphere. The orange lighting comes from the original ceiling recesses that used to allow daylight in and steam and smoke out. Baker Street is one of the largest stations on the whole underground, with no fewer than ten platforms, four of which are for the Amersham, Watford and Uxbridge trains of the Metropolitan Main Line. A60 and A62 stop trains, each comprising of two sets of four vehicles, work through as far as Aldgate in peak hours. The junction is simply known as Baker Street Junction. Lights are provided through all the tunnels, normally only turned on outside service hours. The generous width of the tunnels to accommodate the broad gauge can clearly be seen. Great Portland Street Station was originally opened as Portland Road. It's also been carefully restored to recreate the atmosphere of the original.
just a few minutes away from the mainline terminus, Euston Square was originally called Gower Street. As part of driver-only operation, all trains now have mobile radio communication with the line controller, in this case located at Baker Street. We're now approaching the island platform at King's Cross, dating back to 1941. A complex of subways links a total of eight underground platforms with King's Cross Mainline Station. By the way, Intercity also run trains. There are also direct subway connections between the underground and St Pancras Mainline Station. A recent survey found King's Cross to be the second busiest of all LUL stations, with over 50 million passengers a year either starting or finishing their journey here. The original King's Cross Metropolitan platforms now lie derelict. Just behind the wall to our left is King's Cross Thameslink, British Rail's cross London service recently revived. The trains use the old widened lines as they've always been known, ever since the Metropolitan Railway widened its cuttings to allow an extra pair of tracks for the passage of outer suburban trains. The widened lines used to link the city with both the King's Cross Great Northern and St Pancras Midland lines. Today, only the latter remains. The line is now following the course of the Farringdon Road. It's approximately one mile from King's Cross to Farringdon.
The city widened lines now burrow underneath, principally to facilitate access to the old London Chatham and Dover Railway by means of the Snow Hill Tunnel. GNR trains ran through onto the LCDR from 1866 until 1907. Both companies also ran services into Moorgate, the latter by means of the long abandoned Aldersgate curve. The eastern terminus of this first underground railway was originally called Farringdon Street and was located slightly further to the south on land vacated by Smithfield Cattle Market. The Class 319 electrics on the Thameslink service change here from 25 kilovolts AC overhead power on the London Midland region to 750 volts DC third rail on the southern. The service extends as far as Bedford to the north and Brighton to the south. Incidentally, the underground four rail negative return system of current collection is nominally rated at 630 volts DC. The broad gauge was never installed east of Farringdon, and as we leave, passing three stabling sidings, the tunnels become noticeably narrower. The GWR did continue to run certain through trains, though. This was the first extension of the original line. Farringdon Street closed at the same time as the new alignment to Moorgate was opened in 1865. This station was originally called Aldersgate Street. It had a fine overall glazed roof that was shattered during Second World War bombing. The name has gone through various permutations, finally becoming simply Barbican in 1968, at the same time as the newly constructed Barbican housing development. We now turn on to a new alignment in concrete tunnel constructed in 1964, also as part of the Barbican development. And so we arrive at Moorgate, once again with the suffix street until 1924. As we approach, we pass the junction serving the two bay platforms used by terminating LUL trains. There are two more platforms on the far side used by peak hour BR services. Moorgate lies close to the heart of the city financial district and the Bank of England is within easy walking distance. With the main goal achieved, it was a further 10 years before this extension was opened in February 1875 to Liverpool Street Mainline Station itself. Regular services only lasted a few months until the current underground station was opened in July of that year as Bishopsgate. The old spur, as it had now become, remained in occasional use until the turn of the century when it was removed and Bishopsgate was renamed Liverpool Street. Thank you. 
The Bay Road, the traditional terminus for the Metropolitan Services to Aylesbury and beyond, was taken out of commission to allow temporary offices to be erected for building contractors working on the Liverpool Street remodelling scheme. This extension was opened in 1876, as far as Aldgate, not to be confused with Aldgate East. The former station now lies on the short spur between the Metropolitan and District lines and forms the eastern boundary of the Circle line. It's the only station to be served exclusively by Circle trains for most of the day. At peak times, as already mentioned, the station is the easternmost terminus of the Metropolitan mainline service. Metropolitan trains take the northern spur of this triangular layout. As we approach the junction with the district line, we pass through the site of the original Aldgate East Station of 1884. It was recited to its present location in 1938. Train frequency is maintained here with the Metropolitan Line supplementing that of the district's Upminster Line services. Upminster in Essex is 18 miles from central London and therefore the easternmost extremity of the underground. This section was opened in 1884 to Whitechapel and to New Cross on the East London line. You can just make out the old platform of St Mary's Station, closed in 1938. The East London line junction has not been used by passenger trains since 1905, but of course is retained for stock movement, etc. we get the junction signal for Platform 1 at Whitechapel. Although it's a through road, off-peak metropolitan trains all terminate here. In peak hours, the service is extended to Barking, adding an additional seven and a half route miles to the nine already covered. The district line extension beyond here opened in 1902, with metropolitan services following from 1936. Beneath the main station lies the East London line. A stock trains are currently in use for the service between New Cross or New Cross Gate and Whitechapel.
peak times, the service is extended to Shoreditch. The district line normally operates two services along here, Upminster to Richmond and Barking to Ealing Broadway. We're bound for Ealing Broadway on board a D-stock train, the most recent build of surface stock. These are classified as D78 after the year of manufacture. Both C and D-stock trains are unpainted aluminium and built by Metro Camel in Birmingham, although the district stock differs from the circle in a number of ways. For example, the trains have passenger-operated single-leaf doors which are activated and closed by the driver. The most significant difference, though, is the wheel size. For the first time, tube stock wheels have been used in order to cut down the number of different types of wheel sets in use. This is Minories Junction. Just out of sight to our right is Aldgate Circle Line Station once more. Now the district follows the southern half of the circle all the way to Gloucester Road. This section was actually built by the Metropolitan Railway and opened in 1882 to Tower Hill. During the day, Wimbledon trains terminate here in addition to Edgware Road. The station was originally called Tower of London for obvious reasons. Today it also provides an interchange with the Docklands Light Railway, albeit with a three minute walk. The original station only lasted two years. It was then replaced by Mark Lane situated just here, and it in turn was closed in 1967 with the switch back to the original site, that of today's station. The points are for the bay platform.
Train frequency along here is even greater than on the northern half of the circle. With an additional six trains an hour, the frequency is increased to every two minutes off peak. This station is, of course, named after the monument, which marks the site of the centre of the Great Fire of London in the 17th century. Monument Station was opened as Eastcheap and is also very close to the heart of the city and the Bank of England. It even has a subway connection with the central line at Bank Station. The blue door's closed light on the far panel is fail-safe. If the doors are obstructed, it will not light and the train cannot be moved. Cannon Street is the interchange with British Rail's Mondays to Fridays only city terminus. approaching Mansion House, just prior to its closure for complete refurbishment. The station dates back to 1871 and marks the point on our trip where we encounter the original district railway as a separate entity. The company was originally incorporated in 1864 as the Metropolitan District Railway, just to confuse everybody. The district, as it was known virtually from day one, had opened eastwards from South Kensington in three stages from 1868. The first stage was to Westminster, the second to Blackfriars, and the third to Mansion House. This is Blackfriars, opened with the second stage in 1870. Little 
mention has been made of the motive power in the early days of the two underground companies. Naturally, for the period, there was little alternative to steam. Special steam locomotives had water condensing apparatus that could keep down some elements of the engine's emissions. However, for the drivers in their open cabs, driving through pitch darkness with only semaphore signals to guide them, it's remarkable how few accidents there were. There were many more ventilation holes at the time, however, and a certain amount of additional daylight too. The passengers were better off. Riding in four or eight-wheeled enclosed gaslit coaches, contemporary accounts show that there was little complaint and much applause. Temple has had a subtle name change. It was originally the Temple. The station takes its name from the nearby inner and middle temples, two of the four inns of court that barristers have to belong to in order to practice law. The white triangular signal at the bottom of the picture is a rail gap indicator. Three red lights automatically illuminate when traction current is discharged, preventing the train's pickup shoes from bridging the rail gap. Embankment Station has also variously been known as Charing Cross, being at the Thames Embankment end of the mainline station. Video monitors and mirrors were, of course, introduced with driver-only operation. With the curved platform at Westminster, only the cameras can see round the corners, but on straight platforms, mirrors have proven to be most satisfactory. Before 1907, the station was called Westminster Bridge. We're now travelling over Section 1 of the District Railway, opened on Christmas Eve 1868 from South Kensington. This is one of the sections of line covered over in recent years by office development. Thank you. 
Situated above St. James's Park is London Underground's head office at 55 Broadway. Victoria is London's busiest underground station, with 73 million passengers using it in 1988. That's an incredible 10% of all underground journeys either starting or finishing here. Up until 1969, with the opening of the Victoria Tube Line, most passengers from the Southern Region Mainline Station either travelled on the Circle and District Lines or from the significantly large Forecourt Bus Station. Power, braking and dead man's handle are all on one controller. This is Sloane Square. It was the first non-tube station to have escalators installed back in 1940. However, they'd only been in use for nine months when they were destroyed by a direct hit from a wartime bomb. The station was rebuilt and reopened in May 1951.
South Kensington, or South Ken as the locals call it, was where the Metropolitan Company trains met those of the district company for the first time in passenger service on that Christmas Eve in 1868. On that day, effectively half of the so-called inner circle was complete, clockwise all the way from Westminster Bridge to Moorgate Street. The full circle, with through trains, ran for the first time 16 years later, in October 1884. Circle and district trains run on separate tracks here at Gloucester Road. The station was originally called Brompton Gloucester Road. The circle line diverges to the right towards High Street Kensington. This junction is simply known as the Triangle. Between the tracks are stabling bays, known as the Triangle sidings. Clearly, the flyender for westbound Edgware Road to Wimbledon trains works well as we approach Earl's Court, sometimes referred to as the crew of the district line. In fact, all branches of the district converge here. This station dates from 1878, when it replaced the first, which lay a little further to the east, opened seven years earlier. The first of the western extensions of the district was that to West Brompton, now on the Wimbledon branch, opened in 1869. Leaving Earl's Court beneath the famous exhibition hall, the Wimbledon lines branch off to the left. Shortly to the right, you'll see the Kensington Olympia branch, which now has a regular shuttle service from High Street Kensington. From the right is where a stream of engineers' trains enter the system during the night from nearby Lily Bridge Depot. Hauled in the main by battery locomotives, they head for all parts of the underground network.
This section from Earl's Court was opened as far as Hammersmith in 1874. West Kensington was called North End Fulham at first. Ever since South Kensington, the Piccadilly tube line has been running parallel, albeit underground. Now the tube line emerges between the eastbound and westbound district tracks. Barron's Court was opened in 1905 and provides cross-platform interchange with the Piccadilly line. The fifth track here is a centre reversing road for terminating Piccadilly trains. Hammersmith District is a subsurface station situated right in the middle of the Hammersmith Broadway one-way system with a subway connection to Hammersmith Met. This is a train of 1973 tube stock built in preparation for the Heathrow Airport link opened in 1977. just approaching the one-time Studland Road Junction. To our right is the remains of the connection with the Hammersmith and City Line mentioned at the start of our journey. It was originally built by the London and South Western Railway for their line from Kensington Addison Road, now Olympia, to Acton on their existing Richmond Line. It was opened in 1869. The district extended along here in 1877 after running powers were granted over the LSWR tracks the connection being made at Studland Road Junction. With electrification, a second pair of tracks solely for the district was provided. After 1916, the LSWR's service was withdrawn and their tracks lay derelict until taken over by the Piccadilly extension from Hammersmith in 1932. Piccadilly Line now provides a non-stop service from Hammersmith to Acton Town. 
This was originally Shaftesbury Road. This is Stamford Brook, an unusual layout here, for one of the original LSWR island platforms has been removed and the new reinforced concrete one built, facing the district eastbound track only. This is Turnham Green. branch diverges to the left, shortly to join up with the North London line at Gunnersbury Junction. This is Chiswick Park, opened as Acton Green in 1879 and totally rebuilt in 1933.
Just to our left, you can see the London Underground Equipment Overhaul Workshop at Acton, with a connecting line coming in from the left just before Acton Town Station. Until 1910, this was called Mill Hill Park. From 1905 to 1959, there was a shuttle service from here to South Acton, latterly run by a single double-ended car. This is Acton Town North Junction. Here, tracks from both the District and Piccadilly lines connect with the Heathrow branch, as well as feeding Ealing Common Depot to our right. The branch was opened by the District Railway as far as Hounslow between 1883 and 1884. The Piccadilly started running over the line in 1933, but the District continued to provide a peak hour service until 1964. The Heathrow branch diverges to the left. Now we pass over the top of the connecting Piccadilly lines, at the same time as our line converges with the Uxbridge branch. Both Piccadilly and district trains now share one pair of tracks. There were, incidentally, four tracks as far as Northfields on the Hounslow branch, but with the complex flying junction, each could be accessed without conflict. Another 1930s rebuild, Ealing Common enjoys a basic five-minute service frequency throughout the day, alternating between District and Piccadilly trains. The latter running to Rayner's Lane, off-peak, to connect with the Metropolitan Main Line from Baker Street. Extension to Uxbridge is normally peak hours only. We now cross over the Western Region Main Line and take the 20 mile an hour turnout at Hanger Lane Junction towards Ealing Broadway. Until 1933, the Uxbridge Line was also a branch of the district. Broadway station as we see it today 
dates from its rebuilding between 1965 and 1966, when, for the first time, the hitherto separate district line station was incorporated into the whole. The district line has terminated here since 1879. There was one exception, however. For two and a half years, from 1883, trains were extended a further 15 and a half miles to Windsor over the GWR. The total combined mileage of the district today is 40 route miles serving 60 stations. There are nine platforms at Ealing Broadway, three for the district, two for the central tube line, and four for the main line. The central line, dating from 1920, provides an all-day service right through the heart of London as far as Epping in Essex. Network South East DMUs provide an interval service from Paddington to Slough and Reading. Nowadays, the Circle Line begins at Hammersmith and shares tracks with the Hammersmith and City Line to Liverpool Street. Trains then combine with the District Line, completing the loop around central London by terminating at Edgware Road, a total of 17 route miles. The three terminal platforms have been extended to accommodate the brand new S-Stock trains, first introduced onto the Hammersmith and City Line in July 2012. On departure, we can see Hammersmith Depot. Note the C-stock train to our far right, which was removed to booths of Rotherham for scrapping two weeks after filming. Circle line services were extended from Edgware Road to Hammersmith on the 13th of December 2009. Not only has this led to an increased service over the Hammersmith branch, but also allowed a more regular service to operate around the circle. From here to Farringdon, we traverse the very first passenger-carrying underground railway in the world, opened by the Metropolitan Railway on the 10th of January 1863 and powered by steam. Notice the generous loading gauge of the tunnels. The line was constructed by means of the cut-and-cover method, where a trench was excavated and bricked over. The route consisted of two running lines, each with three rails, allowing the passage of broad gauge and standard gauge trains. The common rail was located on the same side as the station platforms. Prade Street Junction is where the circle and district lines from High Street Kensington converge, more of which later.
Of all the inner circle stations, Bayswater retains its original character best of all. C.W. Clark's building dates from the station's reconstruction in 1926. Having completed our journey over the circle, we now turn our attention to the Hammersmith and City Line. At Allgate East, we rejoin the District Line. Surfacing at Bow Road, we continue overground for the remainder of our eight and a half mile journey to Barking. A so-called new route master leaves Liverpool Street on the number 11 bound for Fulham Broadway. station entrance facing onto the Bow Road is little altered from day one. Note the cycle hire docking station for those who want to arrive or depart by pedal power. To reach the former Campbell Road junction we now climb a gradient of 1 in 32, the steepest used by passenger trains on the whole underground. With passengers having alighted and platform staff having closed the doors, we're staying on board as Derek takes the train into the reversing sidings. There's a 10 mile an hour speed restriction into the stabling sidings, which were brought into use following closure of the depot at East Ham. Typically, the track is not up to the same standard as that of the main running lines. <laughs> 